Hi, everyone. Um, yes, this is institutional dissemination of OER and institutional policy. Uh, might be listed as dissimulation online. Um, apologies, it's dissemination. Um, but I'm glad to, to be here today talking with you all. Um, and again, again, this is just going to be limited a little bit to what we work on um, with the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative and OER efforts at K-State. Um, and I do recognize that that is a four-year institution with um, graduate degrees offered. Um, and so what I'm hoping is I kind of show you what we've been working on and what we've been doing, and then we open it up for discussion um, because policy looks different and policy is informed by policy. So that kind of sharing would be really great um, as, as we all look to, to chaperone OER here in Kansas. Um, so yes, I'm Emily Finch. I am the scholarly communication and copyright librarian um, at Kansas State University. I am housed in the Center for the Advancement of Digital Scholarship, which is a subsection of our academic services team, which is going to be you know, comprised of our academic specialists. Um, and some things I do in that role um, outside of running that copyright consultation service um, is I currently act, um, but will be stepping down as the secondary, um, as kind of the primary day-to-day -day admin um, position for the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative, um, and I'm serving as a member on that, that panel or team. Um, the administrator for the K-State Open Access Publishing Fund, uh, which helps support Gold APC Publishing. I am the Monograph and Special Publications Coordinator for New Prairie Press, um, and I do some other SCALCOM instruction reference and support, um, and you'll see these all kind of connect in a, in a, in a, a nice web. Um, which is why I'm very excited to talk about dissemination efforts here and policy. So a little bit about what I'll be talking about today, um, just big picture things, a little bit about the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative in particular, um, a little bit about who is OER at K-State, um, some the things I've learned in maintaining and growing OER programs uh, and how that shapes policy and procedure um, a little bit about how we showcase and disseminate our OER um, and some ideas we have moving forward, um, some building and documenting policy tools and tips, um, and then I, yeah, I really want to focus on that discussion component. Um, so a little bit about the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative. And Brian and Andy don't know why I found this picture, um, so that might be a lovely surprise for them, um, but the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative um, started in 2013, um, and it was a, a joint effort, and we're, we're pretty unique. We were based on kind of the two other um, existing models um, it, whoops, in Massachusetts, um, and I'm blanking on the other one, um, but we're unique in that we were faculty driven. Um, and so Brian and Andy, or Dr. Bennett and Dr. Lynn Shield from Food Dietetics, Nutrition and Health and Mathematics uh, worked with Beth Turtle, a librarian, um, to kind of put this together and explore um, OER and open material as a means of defraying the costs for students who are purchasing textbooks. Um, and keep in mind, 2013, uh, you know, Amazon has existed at this point, um, and it's certainly a good secondary market for textbooks, but it isn't, you know, what it is today. So the number of students paying full price for things um, varies throughout our project, but back in 2013, uh, the number of students paying that, that full $300 price tag um, was of course much higher than it is today with, with the different rent and uh, secondary market options. Um, in 2016, we partnered closer with the Student Governing Association and added the course fee component of our program. So we run a, a program that features a, a grant and a course fee option, and I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, then in 2019 and 2020, the initiative started really gaining momentum um, and uh, Dean Lori. Um, our former Dean of Libraries and Dr. Bennett and Dr. Lynn Shield uh, put together an application and we were accepted for the, um, to be the recipient of the foundations all in for K-State Giving Day. Um, so a big 24 hour period of giving just to our cause, um, which was fantastic. Um, that was slated for March, 2020. Um, in late February, 2020, um, I start in this position. And uh, so does the pandemic that starts too. So all in was postponed. Um, and so looking at kind of OATI, what I wanna indicate here is at the very outset uh, of this presentation is, is policy um, and participation are dictated by a wide variety of stakeholders um, and not all are incredibly apparent. Um, and so what I provided here is a little bit of our data on, on where we were getting money um, to, to fund ourselves. Um, and I'd like to show this again, um, and donors 
yes, donors are part of all in two donors before are just independent donors specifically for this. Um, but support of the OACI and what's changed um, and why we care so much about policy is the propensity to change and do really great things because of this gigantic shift uh, in, in, in spending power. Um, so yes, this March, we had our postpone all in day. That was a partnership with the foundation, um, looking at, again, focusing on student costs the year before, um, well, the 2019, postpone 2020, um, was the cat's cupboard. So all in's really focusing on, on student quality of life um, and ways that we can all come together as faculty, staff, campus, alums, donors, um, to support our students. Um, we raised a little over $500,000 uh, specifically to go to us um, and had donors in every state. Um, so that was very exciting. And again, this is, it's a very similar model to the other one, but instead of looking at who's giving money, just looking at the money um, and what we will be able to do um, moving forward, um, which is why I'm notorious in the group for being a bit of a stickler on, on policy, getting it documented, um, and then looking at, at ethics uh, as we continue and, Ethics and sustainability are probably my two buzzwords that, that people who work with me will attest. Um, I say maybe too much. Um, so about the grant side of things. Um, so the grant is um, typically up to 5,000. Um, we've given more. Uh, we give less for, for smaller, more adapt projects, but $5,000 for the adoption or adaption um, or the creation of a brand new OER. Um, we review twice a year in April and December, but the application is continuously open. So we just pull at those two dates to review. Um, we assess you know, basic demographic information, um, the, evaluate the plan, um, and then also look at the student needs. And that's both looking at kind of ROI, what size classes are we serving, um, how niche is the field? And that kind of works in both ways. And a lot of people assume niche field means we're less likely to fund. Um, and that's not true because niche field also tends to correlate with significantly higher costs for materials. Um, and so we review that information um, as kind of the core panel, Dr. Bennett, Dr. Lynn Shield, um, some librarians, and then also members of the Student Governing Association, the Accessibility Center. Um, and we invite really kind of our OER superstores, some of our a select few of our um, kind of real movers and shakers for OER who've done grants or well, a grant or grants with us in the past. Um, to look over these and provide perspective. Um, with the award, we issue two payments, the first half upon the acceptance, and the second when we get the final product and a final report, report just reflects on the experience of using that material in instruction for the first time. Um, there's no set list of questions, no set rules. We're just looking to, to understand and assess how the use of the material went and how the building of the material went. So we can look at sustainability and what support's needed um, from us to, to ensure that these are successful. Um, something unique about that, so the, the money is actually uh, taxed, but um, dependent on, on how faculty want to use it. And so faculty can use this to supplement salary. They can use it to supplement PD funds. Some have used it to go and present on their OER at their specific field conferences or at OER conferences. Um, and also to pay graduate students or editors um, to support that work. Um, so we're really generating incredibly high quality, detailed um, gap filling work here with our grants. Um, the other half of the project is of course the course fee and the course fee can operate on the grant projects. And so if you adopted, adapted um, or created something you were eligible for the fee, um, that fee is a $10 charge for each student enrolled in that eligible course. Um, we review course data to submit to the registrar and central admin every February and September. Again, we're looking at the demographic information, um, the class information, um, and we've moved to a model, and I'll get that a little bit more in policy, but to a certification of no cost materials um, and then the type of reporting. Um, so we're looking at, is this the first time? Have you just made this move? Is this because of a grant project um, or have you been one of our couple hundred who've been with us since the beginning in 2016. With that fee, $9 goes to the courses department approximately, um, and a dollar goes to maintain the OATI grant. Um, and so while uh, someday our budget line will return to a, a more stagnant level um, after that big peak we had here in 2021, um, the project is, is trying to be sustainable and equitable and we use the course fee to do so. 
Oh, anyway, so you can see student savings by year. Um, and this is calculated uh, using the courses build um, and the enrollment in that class. Uh, we do use the OEN, formerly OTN, which is always why I pause, um, equation, which is the cost of the material. If it's under 100, you use the actual cost. If the material costs over 100, you use 100 to reflect um, the secondary book buying market um, and then times enrollment. Um, I will little, do my little asterisks. We know that that equation is not perfect, that there are a number of existing equations out there. Spark has a different figure, for example, um, but that's the one we've used since the dawn of time, so we continue to use, um, but that's how we generate these numbers. Um, so who is OER at K-State? Um, OATI is certainly Open Alternative Textbook Initiative, and sorry, I speak in a lot of acronyms, but librarians do that. Um, uh, is the, the biggest push for OER on campus. Um, that said, OER uh, exists in little pockets. And part of what I'm hoping out of this presentation is, is to explore how to uh, harvest those and get them involved with the grant and reward our faculty for the work that they're doing. Um, so again, I show this again, um, because this is kind of the, the plain view of our stakeholders. Um, but it's, it's a little more complex than that. Um, so our stakeholders for OER at K-State um, include the library. Um, so our subject librarians are archivists who are pulling material for, for books, uh, ILL services um, for those um, resources uh, that are alternative um, and are using library resources are fair use. Um, the K-State Registrar who uh, actually coordinates the, the enrollment system to include our little O logo to indicate things are open so that during enrollment and registration and even advising, students can strategically pick courses uh, that cost less. Um, certainly our, our instructors, uh, our faculty and staff who, who use these resources and collaborate on them. Um, K-State IT who helps us make the best use out of Canvas um, and other different student learning tools. A special shout out because of COVID and the way that that changed things. Um, our students uh, who uh, not only keep us motivated and are the, the fundamental reason we are doing this, um, but also are, are huge advocates. Um, we had a couple different applications, but the most recent one, a um, couple graduate students actually were interested in applying for a grant because they were unhappy with the material they were teaching um, and supporting undergraduate classes and wanted to redo it. Um, so students are very much the beneficiary of this project, but also um, a huge part of, of every stage of it. Um, that's independently and then also through the Student Governing Association, um, which is how we secured kind of our first couple serious pools of funds, um, financial services for uh, recording that billing. And then of course the foundation, um, not just for all in, um, but for additional marketing um, that's happened on the project um, for the last several years. Um, and so why do I bring all that up? Um, because that is that is the crew that it takes uh, for OASTI's reach to be that extensive. Um, our grant projects cross two campuses and we have 48 unique departments and offices that have applied and created a resource. Um, this, you know, uh, I'm working on getting data to, to do some, some more manipulation on this, but big, big picture in terms of representation of, of campus units. Um, Arts and Sciences is the largest college, but by college, the number of um, courses using the course fee, so students are benefiting from that is depicted here. Um, communication wise, uh, and that's communicating policy, communicating OER, um, we rely on a number of tools, um, and that is OACI hosted information sessions, uh, which is, is I noticed 50% very specific and tailored to, to the project, um, but the other 50% really is kind of the fundamentals of OER. Um, and we're getting a lot of our, our great questions about OER in the marketplace um, and open monographs um, through those sessions. And that's a, a, a primary communicator uh, and, and place that, that those ideas are starting and those needs are being um, made clear. Um, we have a website for the Open Alternative Textbook Initiative that currently serves as our biggest home for OER information. Uh, the OITA runs that with the library and we communicate through that. Um, a Canvas course for current members um, and participants in the grant and fee uh, to hopefully start sparking some discussion that's relatively new. Um, working with KBOR and KBOR programming, um, both at the, the OEN membership that's being explored um, and partnerships with the press, um, looking at ways to ex extend OER that way. Um, our individual OEN network participation prior to that 
Um, our donors and alumni uh, were very excited about OER, and I received a large amount of communication specifically on it, um, it, you know, asking to explain what this is doing in the market, and that's been a very beneficial relationship, not just because they gave us money, um, but, but because Kansas uh, is, is caring about, about, about the kids and the cost of college. Um, students in SGA, and I mean, even down to my student worker who's processed probably 30 hours of data so far uh, in her five months of employment with me. Um, the librarians who have been pushing OER um, amidst the serials crisis and the cost of journals and the cost of subscriptions and the library fire in 2018 and access to material. Um, and then really uh, the foundational kind of speakers on, on OER are, are our faculty and our instructors uh, who, who've built projects with us. Um, the fastest spread I see is I heard this about so-and-so they talked to me at this, I ran into them at this, uh, they got me interested, um, how do I get involved? And so with all of that, looking at growing OER and managing it in policies, um, why I listed all that and went through all that, we're talking about the people that are building and shaping and defining OER here at K-State. Um, and we're talking about our stakeholders and the need to serve them and their needs. And then we're also looking at the initiative and its needs. And it's a constant balance between people needs and policy needs. Um, and so policy is very much shaped at a micro level by consideration of each and every one of these stakeholders, uh, which can make policy very unruly. Um, a little bit about kind of big policy shifts, which I think are interesting and worth documenting in OATI. Um, so again, we started in 2013. Uh, that course he was added in 2016. Um, in 2020, with the onset of all in, looking at the language we're using, um, and again, keep in mind, OER is, is kind of, most people know what it means in higher ed now. 2020, there's that, that understanding, um, but we're still working to define it. Um, we internally looked and started to define what we meant by open, what we meant by alternative. Um, up until then, uh, your grant money could go to fund a Canvas course uh, that used permalinks and library material. Um, and that line between open and alternative wasn't clear. Uh, as your friendly neighborhood copyright nerd, uh, that open component means a lot to me. Um, and it is frequently muddled in the scholarly communication and higher ed field. So what, what is open? And are we looking at, at that and our use of it? Um, and so we started talking and really focused on, on where we wanted to take projects in the future, which was in a, a more strict definition of open um, and alternative. And it really kind of became clear that the grant project is really focused on that open component, that adoption, adaption within Creative Commons licenses or public licenses and building and publicly licensing that work. And that alternative became the course fee. Um, and so in 2020, 2021, we redefined our policies uh, about reporting that course fee, um, where instead of having to have us review that at a, at a level similar to the grant, um, which expose a lot of liability. I love copyright, I love being your copyright librarian, um, but me also being a lover of academic integrity and academic freedom, me and your Canvas courses, trying to copyright provenance, especially with that lovely Georgia State case decision that came out in 2020, um, wasn't possible. So we moved to the model where you, you testify that you are using non-cost material and that's what alternative began to mean for us. Um, and both geared towards the end goal of, of affordability for students. Um, 2021, we introduced an MOU. Uh, so we were formally understanding as we celebrated and shared our faculty and our instructors works, how they wanted them to be shared, um, which included um, some kind of managerial policy changes, uh, including, you know, you need to list a, a date of anticipated completion, communicate with us, um, but also Creative Commons license the work non-exclusively so that K-State knows how we can save it, how we can use it, um, and, and how you'd like it shared. Um, so we can really look at the sustainability of these projects. And with our land grant mission, oh, and I also mentioned happy birthday, K-State. It's K-State's birthday today. Um, we can really look at kind of serving that land grant mission and serving the entirety of Kansas um, and other, other instructors locally uh, in Kansas or nationally or internationally that would really benefit from our work. Um, and then most lately, um, and the policy is soon to be rolled out. So if you, you catch me in the lie here, I'm working on editing the website. It does not reflect it yet. Um, the biggest kind of policy change of late has been because of that focus on open, 
we are requiring an established platform to be used uh, in exchange for the grant. And that's really to look at sustainability, to look at open, to look at metrics. Um, so we can also support faculty um, and uh, the academic market and understanding the significance of these works. And um, so quality sustainable works that we can get metrics on and share um, is huge. And so uh, our two primary platforms are Pressbooks and LibreText. Um, that said, submissions are welcome for other OER platforms that do similar things. Or if you're, yes, if you're coming out of computer pro, you know, programming and you can build a stable HTML website, um, we, we, we would review that, yes. Um, but, but instead of Canvas courses, uh, which Canvas Commons is, is very rarely searched and used that way for the, an entire course, um, moving towards that direction. So that's a lot of information, um, but I think what I'm trying to hit on here is, is policy is, is ongoing and as you learn and your project grows and, and shapes, that's, that's what you're considering. Um, we've moved again to the reporting versus an application. We've defined open and um, alternative. We've made data reporting mandatory uh, to ensure that we are ethically and accurately charging students for that money. Um, we've created that memorandum of understanding, uh, not just so we know how to use their work, um, but so that there is a greater sense of the relationship and camaraderie that we are trying to build. We are trying to build a culture of OER, and the MOU is intentional about expressing that. Um, it's, you know, we are, as the panel and as the libraries, constantly looking for ways to improve that dissemination component and get metrics um, to support you. We've had interest lately in, and increased the interest lately in, in tenure statements um, reflecting OER and OER publishing. Um, which again, OER publishing is, is relatively new. Open monographs uh, can run like open access journals, but the, the world isn't quite there yet. Um, and also really looking back at that stakeholder, we, were, we grew fast and intensely for several years. Um, and these are all reflections of, of working to look at these core stakeholders and their needs to make sure they're getting the data they need, the data that we need. Um, and taking a, a more open approach to the, the administration of this project, where instead of there was one primary administrator doing all the back end work who knew everything worked, um, and then they retire and a newbie comes in and uh, shakes things up and tries to piece things together, um, looking at a collaborative approach to the project. Um, what I've learned for what it's worth um, in terms of developing policy, um, working guided by the program goals and really drilling out a mission vision value statement um, is huge um, because it, it works to hold you accountable and shapes where your policy is going. Um, that focus on affordability and that focus uh, as it evolved into open and sustainable, it was a huge shift that's hopefully reflected in some of those policy changes we made. Affordability is still our bottom line, um, but by looking at defining open and alternative differently, we looked at serving that that mission in different ways uh, to expand and improve um, on, on the broader academic market. Um, stakeholder needs. Uh, these programs take a, a lot of people to make them work um, and good policy needs to reflect the needs of all of those individuals. Um, liability and ethics, I warned you, I say it a lot. Um, sustainability, which is really huge in OER. Um, if you watch Skullcom, you see that the crisis maintains constant, but a lot of movements come and go and uh, the meanings behind names change. Um, and so focusing on that sustainability, uh, both internally um, and for the sake of, of OER uh, as a movement is really important. Um, and then finally growth. And I put growth last intentionally because uh, sustainability and working to maintain those relationships, stakeholders and projects that you have that are working um, is a priority over overextending um, and then losing interest. And then of course, shaping it with intentionality, creativity um, and metrics and assessment. Um, and I bring that met special metrics and assessment up because that's what's driving your policy. Um, part of the reason we switched to a reporting model that is through Qualtrics and is a little bit more regular um, and expected is we have decent numbers, 28.7% of the 202 courses that started um, and have existed have used the course fee for more than six semesters. Um, and part of that was an issue in reporting, part of that was an issue in policy and expectations for reporting. Um, so by altering that, I expect this number to be more reflective of the number of courses that are actually using open material um, because we weren't able to report that accurately. 
Um, certainly it's led to new opportunities. A lot of get a lot of questions about how we managed to secure $500,000, which is huge for an OER program. Um, and the number of people in similar positions to kind of my job that are on grant funded positions alone. And that, that is burning up, up the pot. They have to make these things work. Um, so that's, that's huge. Um, good policy um, and good metrics are, are what get you good partnerships like that. Um, that get you stability, that get you continued kind of growth minus pandemic, um, that shape what platforms you're using and how you're supporting your faculty and instructors and designers and building things. Um, and then also support students through the integration of new tools um, by making platforms mandatory and that focus and policy on sustainability. It forced us to kind of move forward on how are these being used? How is OER on the student end looking? Um, and how can we improve that? So using the, the LTI uh, so that not a oh, you know, wonky iframe in a Canvas course, not linking out to 10,000 tabs. So I think with COVID, everyone's linking out to 10,000 tabs and it's a nightmare. Um, but reducing that for the students so they can interact with those OERs in Canvas has been, been huge. Um, and this is like our humble brag, but what, do, what does this look like? What does that focus in policy and being really intentional look like? And it looks like I can come to you today and say, given the assumption all of our grants are active, which I can tell you they're not, but I can't tell you at a micro level which and which aren't and at what level, but we have saved students in fiscal year 2021 upwards of you know $3.4 million. Uh, our course fee data indicates student savings since 2016 at about 9 million. Um, but when we cross list that with our other data, I'm able to sit here and tell you that We've saved students $2 million with the administration of the course fee alone. And that, that, that's a testament to developing policy around a course fee to attract users and participants. Um, and the number of people I have that start in course fee realize what's out there, get comfortable, and then decide to build a grant um, is huge. I'd say probably half of our existing core, well, maybe a little over a third of our existing course fees are actually grant related. Um, and then finally, that, that means really since 2016, what I can say, um, looking at the numbers of students build is we have saved students over $7 million. Um, so that's huge. Intentional policy can do really great things for you. Um, disseminating policy is hard. Um, and I saw some of my, my colleagues enter this chat and they can, they can call me out on this. Um, Policy and procedure is difficult. Um, who needs to know what at every level is really difficult. Um, the kind of two main mechanisms for policy in terms of, of our, our participants are the website um, and the Canvas course. Um, lately, there's been a, a, an interest, obviously, with All In and the money we have now in growing this. Um, and for what it's worth, other administrators, um, we've partnered with the associate deans, and that's been a, a highly effective way of communicating. Um, and with policy, there's always going to be the individual who wants to know everything that's up to date. There's always going to be the active department head who may be making $10,000 off the course fee who wants to know more about that. Um, but at the same key, not every participant wants that data. Not every department head is actively engaging. Um, at the college level, which is why I shared that data, there, there is interest, there is stakeholder, there's room that they want to grow and you know, chaperone this to with us. Um, and so that's been a really effective channel for kind of some of the I don't want to say last minute, but incremental policy changes. Uh, this is the, actually the first year we effectively um, imposed the mandatory reporting for the course fee. Before, if we didn't hear from you, we billed it until we were told otherwise and had to redact it. Not a great model. Why I had to enforce it? I know it's not a tremendously popular opinion because, yes, there is the reporting of your class. There is reporting of the fee to me. There's conversations about fees standard and then there's also you know textbook reporting for the state for that comptroller to pull anytime they want and it was a lot of reporting and so policy can be very tricky to disseminate and i'm just candid about it and i want to talk about ways to improve that um what isn't so tricky um again that, that's just you know who what when where why and the tornado that i'm stuck in what isn't so difficult is sharing the fantastic work um that k-state is doing um, for the benefit of, of our authors who should be rewarded for this work, for the benefit of students who aren't paying as much for this work or at all for this work, um, and for the benefit of, of other campuses who could benefit from our, our expertise. Um, and so this is uh, our Campus Commons instance of Libre Text. Um, it is, again, very new. It is growing. 
um, but where you can access our library of materials, um, where you could leave a review uh, for this resource. You could submit an adoption report and have this migrated over to your institution's um, instance of LibreText very easily. You can buy print copies, download in different forms, interact with online. Um, so we are spreading the word this way. Um, we also use Pressbooks, um, and that's a great resource uh, since many people have worked with WordPress or some HTML in their life. You know, it could just be MySpace level HTML, but enough to make some things different colors. Um, but it's a really great platform, and we have a public facing catalog when you search New Prairie Press um, to find all of our press books. The beauty of press books, too, is these are super easily to download for student end and for the instructor end to actually just one to one ingest to their course. And you see right here our friendly you know, copyright and, you know, information and a creative commons attribution. So they know what they can do with that. You know, if it's no derivatives, they use it and that's great. If it's not, they can add, adapt, rearrange. I'm um, gonna really make use of these in a really intuitive and easy way. Um, Pressbooks functions as a new Prairie Press instance. Um, it is one of the tools uh, we use for OACI. Um, it is also part of our broader new Prairie Press, our, our digital imprint. Um, here at K-State, um, which we run out of B-Press, uh, which is a digital commons also your product. Um, but what this is really great at is that is that metrics, what we need to be looking at to really shape and change and make a more equitable open access publishing field. And what that gives us is downloads across the country, across the world, um, some really great metrics. Um, so harvesting the fact that this was actually built to be an institutional kind of repository platform that we're using as a press, using it to harness those metrics. And what we've been allowed to do here is, again, give students and, and other users access to that full text in a number of forms to link out to the Pressbooks version if it was built in Pressbooks. There'll be an option to link out to the LibreText version. Um, so that no matter how you're finding the book, if you're searching LibreText, if you're searching our Pressbooks catalog or the existing Pressbooks catalogs that exist and, and kind of compile those, if you stumble upon us in Merlot, if you're searching New Prairie Press and you find us that way, these are all there and we are celebrating specifically kind of the work done by, by OHI and existing OER efforts before that. Um, New Prairie Press has existed as an open access monograph press since 2007. Um, so we're continuing to build, we're continuing to grow. My final little thing is just some, some tips and tricks that might be helpful uh, from the, the resident mover and shaker. <laughs> sometimes to people's dismay of policy here at K-State. Um, living documents. Uh, I see people in this, 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 this participant list who I've sent our, our policies and procedures to. Um, I can tell you right now the copy I have needs to be updated tremendously. Uh, you'll probably all have different copies. Um, it is a living document. Um, and so there are pros and cons to that. And I will, as your friendly neighborhood librarian say, make sure you save a stable permanent copy in multiple places print and digital in case of things like fires um, or employee transfer. Um, but uh, living documents can be great because you're able to create those discussions in bite-sized pieces you know, via comments, via track changes um, with all of your stakeholders with the recognition that uh, policies and procedures can be a lot. Um, and I get to that in, yes, the types of, of what you're doing. Does everyone need to know the operating procedure, these step-by-steps that you do every day, um, or do they just need to know the policies? And that can be a great Open documents can be a great tool for that, assigning sections uh, for revision. Um, a tool I find helpful, and um, I have used this prior, um, but really saw the application for OER. I was a member of the OEN cohort last year. Um, if you are interested in that and OER and that certification to be an OER librarian, I highly recommend it. Um, but one of the biggest things in shaping policy since I've been here has been the SWOT analysis. Um, and we'll, I obviously give off a tone where I tend to focus in weaknesses and threats. That is kind of the best way to look at future policy. Um, but when you talk procedure, focusing on those strengths and opportunities um, is huge and documenting those um, is what's gonna provide that stability, what's gonna provide that, that jumping off point for assessment that's gonna get you great results. Um, there's a lovely debate between overly detailed and too vague. Uh, believe it or not, not everyone I sent this to read the entire document I put together on procedure, where I say where it's saved, how it's saved, how I did the calculation. Um, but having that uh, during um, this day and age and job changes is, is fundamental so that someone isn't inheriting data that they don't understand. Um, and that's again, how we get facts like this uh, that I can generate today. Um, and looking even at things like the average cost of resource to understand how our reporting mechanism 
either is or isn't accurate or is reflective of, of a secondary market. Um, establish goals and metrics up front. Um, some people really like the, the SMART framework, or not SMART, sorry. Yeah, no SMART, all my acronyms, SWOT and SMART. Um, I think it's helpful if you're looking with your mission, vision, values. I think that's a great stage in your policy to be using SMART. Um, but I think on a more micro level, um, you need to not just be looking at goals for administration, um, but what, how policy affects each stakeholder. And I don't harp on that, but administration runs differently than, than stakeholder needs. Um, standardize your metrics at the outset. Don't spend 30 hours with your student worker uh, starting over. Um, but then I'll just finally on, on types of document and being intentional about what you're creating and why. Um, so an operating procedure. So if someone else is working with you on the project can find everything, fantastic. But separating that from policies um, so that admin understands what you're doing and why you're doing it and your stakeholders all have, have given say on that because they don't care about my unique identifiers. Um, only I do, and um, that's fine. Um, but also workflows, being creative and adding some visual components to help other people understand your program better and other institutions understand your program better. I see a lot of value in sharing policy and procedure as a means of growth. Um, and I think that thinking visually is helpful for a lot of people and that this is a great step um, to kind of build workshops and collaboration around this. Um, and then finally, reporting. Um, and as public as you can make that reporting is incredibly helpful and should be its own document, but that should be something you're building into policy. Um, and that's actually how we managed to, to really partner with the foundation was a procedure of submitting a fiscal year report to them. Um, so when we did apply for all in, there was a standard of excellence, a standard of reporting and a standard of metrics that they were able to see um, that indicates we're a good investment um, and our returns for students are significant. I will end there um, with questions if you have them, but also I think it could be very beneficial and I know we all have Zoom fatigue and we are done with Zoom um, and Zoom discussions aren't always great, but I think it'd be very interesting to talk together again because this is one perspective from a four-year institution, um, but about what policy looks like for everyone here um, and different ways to share and collaborate, um, really looking at, at Kansas as a market. Um, but that could just be my interest and you might want your afternoons back. Um, Okay, so there's a question in the chat about sustainability. So your grants uh, take sustainability into consideration. What do you mean about sustainability? Is there more, is there things that are less sustainable? Absolutely. Um, and so one of the metrics that I'm, I'm having my student do a deep dive on, um, but is requiring a lot of institutional data. Um, I don't have the number of, of sections, for example. So if you're teaching English 100 and there's five sections, I can tell you how many years English 100 applied for the course fee and used the course fee. I can't tell you, and I can see enrollment, but I can't tell you section-wise what's going on. And so we are juggling academic integrity and academic freedom. Um, and so when there is an overflow section and someone is assigned to teach that, we can't say use this material. Um, and I think people would be very upset if uh, you came into teaching a class and we said, this is, this is what we use, you have to use this. And it's a Canvas course, for example, and the articles that they teach with organized the way that they organized it. Um, that's unruly. And the likelihood for someone to pass on a Canvas course and for that to be used one to one um, with a new wave of faculty with different instructors across the unit um, is unlikely. That said, how many you know, faculty agree on a, on a textbook uh, you know, that Pearson or that Macmillan copy of something, um, because that's standard, you know what you're getting, um, that's familiar. Um, it is organized in a way that is, you know, modular or literally, you know, in a textbook format. That is more likely to transcend uh, with happiness that, that line of academic freedom, that line between different sections, um, and then certainly that, that line between institutions. I really do, I'm so excited. I mean, I'm a U of M grad, so go blue. Um, but Michigan State, K-State, I love working with land grants, and that really means a lot to me, um, is that that, that reuse. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing, too, I mean, I, I'll call up Colby. I'll look at Colby's work um, on, on soils. The ability of that to apply not only to other land grant institutions teaching similar courses, but also to the layperson um, or industry um, to be able to use that resource. And if that's in a Canvas course, that's not happening. For students who are pursuing graduate programs who are like, oh, I remember that lab I did with Professor Morberg. Uh, how do I find that again? And if it's in a Canvas course, that's gonna be hard to find. If it's a published monograph, if it's a book with a stable link, that's rediscoverable, that is reusable. 
Um, and so focusing on sustainability to us looks at, you know, where are we filling the gap, not just for affordability and material, um, but also the material market to encourage the continued growth of OER as a movement versus especially with the pandemic. And that's where I personally am sensing some danger. There was a lot of, oh no, Canvas course, use the library, which is fantastic. Of course, use your library, permalink to us, yes. Um, but with a serious crisis, not having you know, what we used to, um, which also happened at the same time, we you know, all had to make some cuts. Um, and so for me, I see it as a lot of the work was already half done. Finding that open resources, finding those materials you could use in your, your class during panic pandemic. Um, the next step is turning that into a resource that is the most usable for you that could benefit someone else. Um, and so not losing that momentum, but also not polluting OER with that kind of temporary stopgap um, uh, as we move eventually, hopefully someday back into in-person, um, that the incentive to look at affordability, cost-free, fair use, open access material to be the foundation of your course versus a textbook. Um, and the number of people I heard that's like, well, my student went to you know, spring break uh, when the pandemic started and they didn't bring their textbook and they were trapped in Florida for three weeks without the resources when we tried to move online. That's huge. And what they did is they moved the entire class over to using some articles in OER. Um, I don't want there to be that incentive to go back to the textbook if what we have is working um, and what we have is more sustainable and, and better for our students, um, but also at a low enough burden. So again, capitalizing on the fact that you've already done that work, working with us and literally capitalizing on our capital, our increase in funds right now, um, apply for the OATI grant. Um, you already have the foundations there. I can say we have money um, and that's, that's rare. Uh, and so that's really where I'm looking at sustainability in 2022 uh, as my third keyword in life with liability and ethics is uh, is let's use this time that's been inconvenient and difficult for everyone to do the most good um, for the longest haul. Okay, um, our cutoff time is actually about 2.40, so we're a few minutes over, but um, if Emily's at Kansas State University, if anyone has any questions for her, you can always email her there. Thanks for presenting on this excellent stuff, and thanks to everyone for coming out for this. Yes, come say hi if you're ever in Manhattan. Um, my colleague Carolyn Jackson will be kind of taking over as the primary on this as I step into more copyright consults to support this. Um, but please reach out, happy to share our documentation at whatever stage it's in. Um, and yes, happy if people wanna to get together and talk policies and programs. Um, I, really, I really would like that. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank and you, thanks Emily. for everyone joining us.